in Parade. I was thinking, well, this is a rather fragile substance, and say a little bit got under my fingernail. Would that be the bit that someone loved with? Would that be the bit that they remembered going to the seaside with? Would that be the bit that made them fidget when they spoke? Would that be the bit that made them bite their nails? And it was remarkable that this tiny little bit of white, funny stuff that could easily detach itself and come under my fingernails was the very essence of a person. Um, I explore and study consciousness and this big issue, for my mind, the biggest issue of how the brain works, a little bit like other people will do gardening. That is to say, I do it in my own time, in every little nook and cranny, every little space I can find, or particularly on Sundays here at home. I'll sit and, and look through my books and, and think about it. And for me, it's the most marvellous complement, the mar most marvellous mixture with my experimental science, because my experimental science is about something very important, Parkinson's disease, and indeed Alzheimer's now, uh, but it's concerned with a very small event in the brain, the release of a particular protein, a big molecule, uh, in a particular area of the brain and what it might be doing and why it might be doing it. Um, it's very restricted to a particular brain region. It's not related at all to the whole brain functioning, and I think it's very important to try and work out themes or patterns. Most neuroscientists are very nervous about approaching the issue of consciousness. I think this is because, as a scientist, you are trained always to be objective. That is to say, you will only study something that somebody else can study as well in the same way. This is the cornerstone of science. Now, imagine we now introduce something, a phenomenon, that is subjective. The whole essence of it is that I cannot share it impartially with someone else. This is why it becomes a problem for scientists to study, and why many of them are very nervous and very shy about studying consciousness. So it might seem impossible, then, for a neuroscientist to explore consciousness. Um, the way I've done it is to be a little bit more modest than many neuroscientists. I don't go into the brain and try and find some magic bullet, some special feature that the brain has that is the center for consciousness or the property of consciousness. I've tried a different approach, which is a little bit more modest, which is as follows, which is to try and um, say, what do we want of consciousness? Can we describe it in some way? Are there any properties, any features of consciousness, as I'm experiencing it, the phenomenology, the subjective feel, that we can then go and look in the brain and see if the, the brain can provide for us. Yeah. So the three properties, to my mind, that we can at least discern in consciousness are the following. First, that consciousness is not all or none. It's not like a light going on or a light going off. To my mind, consciousness could grow as brains grow, a little bit like a dimmer switch where you turn a light up and it gradually gets brighter. And if consciousness grows as brains grow, then that would explain the problem that people have had in the past with trying to account for if a fetus is conscious or indeed if animals like rats or lobsters are conscious. I think we could say that, yes, they are conscious, but not as conscious as we are. The second is that we are always conscious of something. There's always a kind of stimulus or a trigger, a sort of epicenter, if you like. And the third property is that at any one moment, we only have one feeling. You just have one consciousness at any one moment. Now, if we put that all together, the image that I have, and let's start with an image first, would be like a stone going in a puddle, that what would happen is that there'd be some trigger or epicenter, the stone, that in itself was a fairly fixed thing, but that would generate in a very transient way, in a very brief way, it'd be over very quickly, um, rather like the ripples on the surface of, 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 a, of a smooth water. And the more ripples and the longer the ripples extended, that could be like 
degrees of consciousness. So that is the model that for me works very well. So let me give an example of, of what might be happening. Let's take a very simple uh, moment of my consciousness. Let's take, for example, this orange. This is a very simple thing we're talking about. This orange is suddenly presented to me. If you were to look in my brain now as I'm looking at this, all you would see would be lots of electrical blips and lots of chemicals squirting around. Nothing is translated back again into the, the feel of an orange. Nothing is translated back again into the color as we see it here. Nothing is translated back again into the, the smell. Everything is put into electrical impulses, electrical signals, and it stays like that. And that's all there is. But nonetheless, somehow, that becomes, in my body, a subjective sensation. But we might imagine that this orange, or oranges are special to me because one connection is with a holiday perhaps in Morocco. Or it might be that I have an orange dress. Or perhaps the holiday in Morocco would then trigger off an association with an old friend who I was on holiday with in Morocco, who I haven't seen for a long time. All these would give me certain feelings that were unique to me. The orange would have a special meaning to me. As we grow, I think gradually our connections become more powerful in how they determine what we see. And it's that growth of connections that I would call the mind. It's the personalization, literally the personalization of your brain, even if you're an identical twin, even if you're a clone, therefore. Your personal configurations will differ from everyone else's, even your clones, and give you a special outlook on life. Hersenonderzoekers weten dat je het bewustzijn niet kunt vinden in één enkele hersencel. Bewustzijn ontstaat pas als er sprake is van een groep hersencellen. Het is een emergente eigenschap. Er is ook geen speciaal gebied in de hersenen waar het bewustzijn zetelt. Volgens Greenfield blijft er maar één mogelijkheid over. So that must mean that within the brain consciousness is potentially multiple. That's to say there are many potential sites that could, for, for whatever reason, suddenly become privileged in some way and able to generate consciousness. And somehow we must think of a way, therefore, for groups of brain cells to be transiently recruited into a kind of working assembly or congress. So what do we mean when we talk about brain cells working together? What do we mean by an assembly of brain cells? They don't all get together and walk towards each other or anything like that. Brain cells stay fixed in the same place in the brain. So when we say working together, what I mean at least, is that the electrical signals that they use anyway to send little local messages one to another, somehow all work in synchrony, they all work together. It's a little bit like a choir where everyone sings together, a large football stadium of people all singing one song all at the same time, instead of just having local conversations with their neighbor or with a group of friends. They'll all start being recruited, singing together. It's a little bit like that within a working assembly. We have to think of them as things that are highly dynamic and highly transient. That is to say, like clouds or like blobs of mercury, they're shifting and banding and disbanding. Bewustzijn ontstaat altijd vanuit een soort kern, als gevolg van een stimulus. Dat kan zowel iets uit de omgeving zijn, een hard geluid of een fel licht bijvoorbeeld, maar het kan zich ook vormen rond een innerlijke stimulus, zoals een herinnering of een gedachte. Hersencellen kunnen deel uitmaken van allerlei verschillende groepen, maar niet tegelijkertijd. Hoe sterker de stimulus, hoe meer hersencellen erdoor geactiveerd kunnen worden. But of course the world is full of sensory stimulation. So before an assembly had time to form properly, there will be a rival assembly attempting to form. So it will be a little bit like this. There will be a battle going on with the strongest one. Whatever is dominant at the time will be my consciousness. Everything else will be subconscious. Now, of course, Someone might say, well, that's, that's fine, but that's just a theory. How do you know that the brain works like that? 
Well, in one sense, we don't know that this is true because it would be very hard to test this theory out because at the moment, even the sophisticated ways of looking into the adult human conscious brain, so-called imaging experiments, even they are not fast enough to capture in less than a second a recruitment of a group of cells. What by mensen niet kan, is sinds kort bij dieren wel mogelijk. In Israël experimenteert de neurofysioloog Greenwald met een speciale kleurstof die reageert op de elektrische activiteit van één hersencel. Een kat krijgt een lichtflits te zien, terwijl de hersenactiviteit wordt gemeten. Binnen een kwart seconde worden 10 miljoen hersencellen actief, waarbij de activiteit zich vanuit een centrum uitbreidt naar buiten. When I visited this laboratory and I saw a picture of this scheme with ripples, I was very excited because it fitted in with my metaphor, if you like. Now, of course, you might say, well, we don't know that the animal in question is conscious. I would say that's not the point. It simply shows that brain cells can work like that. They can form a temporary group. That's all. What will be the factors that will determine how big or how small consciousness will be at any one moment? First is that the connectivity should be there in the first place, that there should be connections between brain cells. Now, the correlate of that in terms of ordinary life is how sophisticated your brain is. We know that babies have far less connections when they are born than grown-ups do, and that the connections are forged, are, are developed in accordance with your experiences and your memories and so on. The next would be the strength of the epicenter. That is to say, in brain terms, how many brain cells are stimulated and how much, how much the hub is activated. In real life terms, that's the significance to you of something or how um, noisy something seems to you, or how bright something seems to you, or in a more sophisticated way, how, how special something is to you. That's the other. And then a third factor, which I haven't really touched on, is important. And this is the one that can vary most from moment to moment. And that is your arousal levels, or the degree to which you're excited. If you're very excited, you're very quickly distracted. We all know. Um, if you're very worried by something or very pleased by something, you cannot concentrate. You're very reactive to the outside world. And similarly, when you are very sleepy, you can't concentrate or think long thoughts. So arousal at the two ends, low arousal and very high arousal, to my mind, would predispose in the brain to only small assemblies being formed because you have lots of competition or they can't um, grow very well for whatever reason. In the middle, when you're awake, but at the same time not too excited or too sleepy, that is the optimum level when your consciousness can spread out. Now, in brain terms, this arousal matches up with different chemicals released in the brain that are like fountains. These chemicals are not like little messengers in local little circuits that have one tiny little sphere of influence. They flood over the whole brain, and in themselves they don't have a particular signal, a particular message to transmit, but they will alert the brain or bias the brain when that signal comes along. possible use of the theory, if you like, um, would be it's a new way of interpreting certain mental states. Let's take, for example, mental disorders such as depression or schizophrenia. Schizophrenics and children have much in common in that they are very reactive to the outside world. Now, I think in schizophrenia, the problem is that the assemblies are too small. And the reasons are as, as follows. In schizophrenia, we know people are very reactive to the outside environment. Often, in fact, they will think they are Christ come again because colors will seem very glowing. 
the outside environment comes in on them. It implodes in on them. They are at the mercy of the outside environment, so that often they feel paranoid. They feel they're being directed or, or told what to do. Is there any disorder that could be characterized by assemblies being abnormally large? Well, one might imagine if an abnormally small assembly is a result of too much interaction with the outside world, where you're not in letting your own internal world grow, then the opposite perhaps is where the outside world would end up being excluded. If you are letting your assemblies grow and grow, is there a condition where the outside world seems gray and remote? Yes, there is. Clinical depression. And it could be that when one takes Prozac, for example, and modifies the availability of a particular chemical, serotonin, that what you're doing is providing a way of modulating your assemblies such that they, they are much smaller rather than, than large. That's just a, a possible idea. Another implication for the theory in terms of our everyday life is, is a pleasure, the sort of things we do for pleasure. <laughs> because it's very interesting. The things we do for pleasure could be interpreted as, again, conditions when we are in the small assembly world. <laughs> Bungee jumping, that some people do, food and sex, dancing, skiing, all these activities are dominated by a very strong stimulation of our senses and reduce us into the current moment to be like a child again, to be the passive recipient of our senses, where things are literally sensational. <laughs> And it could be that this feeling of well-being, this contentment, comes from having a very small assembly. The type of small assembly that characterizes the young child, the baby suckling at the breast almost, where you're just the passive recipient. Perhaps it's an attempt to become the passive baby again, where you're just a vehicle for sensations. <laughs> At the moment, there's a technical problem, but it's only a technical one, in that you can only look over seconds at brain events. You can't look at less than a second. But I think that in the future, that is a relatively trivial point that I'm sure will be solved. Now, what sort of things might one want to measure? Well, I can only speak for myself. I think what I wouldn't want to measure are the things that people measure at the moment, learning and memory. Learning and memory can be done very well in systems that no one says are conscious, namely computers. Learning and memory skills can be done by all number of machines, simple PCs. Learning and memory, to me, is not a very interesting indication of consciousness. Learning and memory is absent in a small child or in an animal, a young animal, but nonetheless, they are feeling something. They are sentient beings. Yeah. So I think the most interesting aspects of consciousness have very little to do with an outward behavior, demonstrating how much you've remembered or how much you've learned or how you've adapted. I think that is a feature in our evolving brains, but it is not the important critical factor. Now, what is it that we have and that animals have that computers don't have, therefore? And that is feelings. And it's feelings for me that are the building blocks of consciousness. Emotions are the building blocks of consciousness. So what I would like to do is test that, test different emotions, and how the stronger the emotion, to my view, the smaller the assembly size. And as the emotion, um, as the assembly grows, I would argue you have less and less emotion. Now, that would mean that someone who was very depressed wouldn't have much emotion. It's not that they are unhappy. A depressed person isn't unhappy, but they have no feelings. They feel numb. And it's a lack of feeling they feel, what a psychiatrist calls a flattening of effect, that is to say, a, a flattening of mood. So one of the implications of this idea, if small neuronal assemblies are associated with feelings of pleasure, like people claim to have a, at a rave, that are we striving for this all the time? Is pleasure, could it be viewed as 
a regression, a, an attempt to become babies again. To, our ravers just wanted to become passive recipients of the senses again. And that would mean, do we want this as a constant state of life? Do we want to just be, get rid of our minds all the time? Well, I think for most human beings, it's a battle between the two things. We are pawn, torn between two forces. On the one hand, we love that pleasure of the food in the mouth or the orgasm during sex or the downhill ski run or for some people the bungee jump or for the raver the beat of the music we we want we seek out we pay money we work in order to put ourselves in in those situations but by the same token if someone said to you right the rest of your life can be spent just eating and drinking and having sex i don't know if everyone apart from joking aside would really want that just to be their lives We know that in human nature, as well as wanting to be the passive recipients, to have pure pleasure, there's something else we want as well that's contrary to that. And I think that's we want to grow our mind. We want to be individuals. We want to impose on the world our own retaliatory individual mark. Ze zijn allemaal rondom hun veertiende jaar van huis weggelopen. Nu, tussen de 18 en 22, krijgen ze de kans een nieuw bestaan op te bouwen op het platteland van Friesland.